بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Shall I continue with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asiratu Nabawiya, the prophetic biography? In the um, last session, we talked about some of the events that began to unfold during the about the six to eight month period after the Prophet sallallahu arrival in Al Badinatul Munawwara. Now, what we've talked about over the last number of sessions is the fact that the first six months of the Prophet ﷺ's residence in the city of Medina was heavily invested by the Prophet ﷺ into developing and solidifying and stabilizing this new, young, blossoming community. From the construction of the masjid to building even homes for his own family uh, to the establishment of the bonds of brotherhood, uh, drawing a charter for the city of Medina, basic rules, regulations, politics, uh, you know, executing certain treaties and agreements with the other communities like the Jewish tribes in and around Medina, and so on and so forth. There were some initial deaths, there were some initial births, there were some initial marriages. All of this was basically going on and a community was really becoming established. What we talked about in the last session was, however, that about six to eight months after the Prophet ﷺ arrives there in Medina, now he turns his attention to dealing with the, you know, what we would typically call the foreign affairs, international relations. And that was, well, now we have this Muslim community here in Medina, but how, what do we do about its relationships with you know, the other tribes or the other people, the other cities. And key amongst them, of course, was Mecca and the Quraysh. And so the Prophet ﷺ realized, and I talked about this at length last time, that there were some initial scouts, there was also some spying that was going on, there were some people that were coming and going. So the Prophet ﷺ started sending out... Uh, Contingencies. He started sending out, you know, groups of people, uh, campaigns and expeditions. And their, their purpose was a couple of things. Number one was to scout the area. Number two was to establish the presence of the Muslims there and somewhat of, uh, some sanctity, um, of the Muslim community as well. And thirdly and finally, they did actually have some very basic, it didn't become military, but some basic confrontation with certain groups of the Quraysh who were in the area. And those were very also interesting incidents where you have 20, 30, 40 Muslims, and you have 200, 300, you know, uh, Quraysh with Abu Jahal and uh, Abu Sufyan and the leaders of the community that were in these groups. And so they had these little bit of, you know, uh, face-offs and little bit of situations. And this is basically what transpired at this point. What we're going to be talking about going forward is insha'Allah, from next week on forward, we're going to talk about the second year of the Prophet Wasallam's residence in the city of Medina, what we Islamically oftentimes refer to as the second year of Hijrah. We'll be talking about the second year of Hijrah. The second year of Hijrah is very interesting and it's very important and very key in the sense that this is where some of the major military expeditions took place. The Prophet ﷺ himself participated and traveled outside of Medina a few times and actually established treaties and alliances with some of the Bedouin tribes, the A'rab, the Bedouin tribes that lived outside of Medina. Therefore, again, fortifying Medina and the Muslim community. Community. And that would eventually lead to the Battle of Badr, which we'll be talking about inshallah over the next couple of sessions. What I'm going to talk about today is going to seem like a little bit of change of pace. Because we've been focusing on the building of the community. We've really been talking about it from, I guess you can say, a more strategic perspective. You know, the establishment of the adhan, the building of the masjid, the establishment of the congregational prayer, the turning of the qibla. We've talked about all these things and how the Prophet ﷺ really built a community. Now we're talking about how he solidified and protected the community through even some military means if necessary. What we're going to talk about today is going to seem a little bit off that track, but it is a very... Um, What's, what's interesting is that historically speaking, this hasn't been a huge issue. 
But contemporarily, it's become a very, very huge issue. It's one of the key questions that is asked every time you engage or you have a discussion with Muslims and non-Muslims. Even Muslims, when you talk to them about the Prophet ﷺ and about the life of the Prophet ﷺ, this is one of the first questions you'll be asked and one of the key questions you're asked. And so, because there is so much confusion, it does warrant addressing properly and, and with some amount of detail. However, I do want to still emphasize that historically speaking, classically, traditionally speaking, this was not really a big issue. Towards the end of the first year of the Prophet ﷺ's residence there in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ basically moved in with one of his, with, with his new wife, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Alright? And this is typically what's called in the Arabic language, Al-Bina'u biha. He moved in with his wife. So a lot of times it's you know, translated as he consummated the marriage, which again has a specific connotation that isn't necessary. But basically he moved in with his wife. Now I'm going to go back a little bit real quickly to refresh mine and everyone else's memory. The Prophet wasallam about this time that we're talking about, I would say probably about three, almost three and a half years Prior to this, the Prophet ﷺ had suffered the loss of his wife. His wife of over 25 years, a mother of his children, Khadija radiallahu anha. About maybe about a year and a half um, after the passing of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, some say up to two years after her passing, before, shortly before he migrated from Mecca to Medina, he was approached by Khawla radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was the wife of Uthman bin Mad'oon. And she basically told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that why don't you get married? That now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for at least a year and a half has been a single father, right? His eldest daughter Zainab is married. And his, um, his second eldest daughter is also married, Umm Kulthum, she's the wife of Uthman bin Affan, and they're living in Habasha in Abyssinia, East Africa. They've migrated there with the group of Muslims. He's got two daughters still under his roof, Ruqayya radiallahu ta'ala anha, and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And especially Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha is still very young. She's in her teens, so she's very young. And the Prophet ﷺ is basically running his home, along with being a messenger and a prophet and running his community and to looking after his people. He's also running his home by himself. He's a single father. And he's taking care of his home himself, all by himself. And so now, one of the community members, Khawla, comes to him and says, Why don't you get married, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet ﷺ says, Okay, do you have any particular suggestions? And she says, Yes, I have two suggestions. And the first suggestion she offers is Sauda bint Zama'a radiallahu ta'ala anha. And we talked about her marriage to the Prophet sallallahu And the second prospect or proposal that I have is Aisha bint Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. The daughter of your very, very close friend Abu Bakr, his daughter Aisha radiallahu anha. The Prophet sallallahu tells her, okay, go ahead and you know um, present this same proposal to them. And so we talked about how Khawla goes to the home of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Umm Ruman who is the mother of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and presents his proposal to Umm Ruman. Umm Ruman says, well I have to wait for Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes home. They hear the proposal. They're of course very excited by it. He had the question that I'm like a brother to the Prophet sallallahu And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi oftentimes used to refer to Abu Bakr as anta akhi, you are my brother. So he was confused that does that mean that establishes some type of actual brotherhood where it would be impermissible to, to marry like my daughter, she would be your niece. So the Prophet ﷺ clarified that no, anta akhi fil Islam. Anta akhi fil Iman. You are my brother in terms of faith in Islam and Iman, but not a biological brother to me. And so they, once they figured that out, they basically went ahead with the proposal and the nikah, the contract, the kitab was conducted. Alright? And now, but at this point in time, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha remains in her home with her family. And about three years after that, about a year after migrating to Medina, now they decide, they decide it's time for her to move in. 
and began living with the Prophet And basically Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha talks about this incident, um, this, this, this event where she says that, you know, they... Uh, basically the time came and the home was prepared and everything, all the arrangements were made. And I, at that point in time, moved in with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And pretty much to, at, the, at the expense of oversimplification, that was that. And they began their life together. However, we know, any Muslim knows, um, when talking about this particular topic, that it really isn't quite that simple um, due to a lot of the discussions that have happened at our particular time. So the discussion basically arises based on the age of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. How old was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha at the time both of her marriage, the nikah, the contract, and then subsequently, how old was she when she moved in with the Prophet ﷺ? The hadith of Bukhari, which is authenticated, of course, the authentic, universally, you know, sound narration of Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari, by the words of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha herself, she says that I was six years old when the contract, when the nikah was conducted, and I was nine at the time that I began to live with the Prophet ﷺ. And so, again, anybody who lives in our modern day culture can see that this is where the conversation arises from. This is where the question arises. That, how do we exactly understand that? And how do we reconcile that? And how do we make sense of that? So, there's a couple of things I'd like to explain. First and foremost, um, just for the sake of, you know, academic integrity, if you will, there are two opinions on the issue. There are two opinions on the issue. The first opinion, the one that I've stated with you, that is in the Hadith of Bukhari, by the testament of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha herself, was that she was six at the time of the nikah, and nine at the time when she began to live in the home of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was generally the opinion and the position of the scholars of the ummah and the historians for, I would venture to say, 11, almost 1200 years. There is a second school of thought which is a minority position, a minority opinion. Um, I found it, I, I, w I was hard pressed to find any classical scholar that held this particular position. But more contemporarily, when I say contemporarily, I mean up to about 150, 200 years ago, um, this opinion was held by a minority of historians and academics. And that is that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was probably, was more likely closer to the age of 12 at the time of the nikah, the contract. And then she was closer to the age of 15 or 16, 12 or 13 at the time of the nikah, the contract, and 15 or 16 years old at the time she began to live with the Prophet ﷺ. And some have even taken it as far as saying she was 15 at the time of the contract, and 18 at the time she moved in with the Prophet ﷺ. But that other opinion is pretty much based on conjecture. There's really not a lot to go on in regards to that. The other position where I'm saying that she is probably about 12 or 13 years old at the time of the nikah, and about 15 or 16 years old at the time where she begins to live in the home of the Prophet ﷺ, that opinion and position is in clear contradiction with the hadith of Bukhari where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha herself says, I was six and nine. It's in clear contradiction with that. But the way they go about in explaining it, is that they say there's another hadith in Bukhari. There's another hadith in Bukhari where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that from the earliest time that I can remember, she says from the earliest time that I can remember, that my both parents, both my parents, Abu Bakr and Umar Uman, both my parents were Muslim. My, my earliest memory of them is them being Muslim. And then she specifically talks about the migration of the Muslims from Mecca to Abyssinia. She says, I remember my parents being Muslim, and I remember the migration from Mecca to Abyssinia. So when you, when you piece that, now you do have a question that arises. See, the migration from Mecca to Abyssinia, Habasha, happened at the latest in the early part of the fifth year of prophethood. 
the early part of the fifth year of Bi'atha of Nubuwa. Now, the Hijrah occurs in year 13. So, eight years. Now, if you, now here there's a little bit of a, a, an assumption. Now, if she says that I remember the migration, and from that earliest memory that I have, now over here there's a little bit of conjecture. They say it's easy to assume she was three, four, five years old. She has an actual memory of it. She has recollection of it. She has awareness, cognizance, like understanding of what actually happened. That there was a migration of Muslims from Mecca to Abyssinia. So if you base that off the fact that she was four or five years old, plus eight years towards the, towards the hijrah, right? Then even at the time of the hijrah, that puts her at the age of like 13, 14 years old. And then you add in another year that puts her at the age of 15. So that's where they're getting this number that at the time of her nikah, she was 12 or 13 years old. And at the time when she began to live with the Prophet ﷺ, she was 15 or 16 years old. That's what this particular opinion is based off of. Now, I'm willing to admit that it's not completely... And so now how do they explain that other narration where she's saying that I was 6 and 9. I was 6 and 9. So they basically say that is her saying it herself. And they, now this is where it starts to kind of fall apart. And they say, well, they weren't particularly keen on keeping track of numbers and ages and, you know, Umar and like ages and numbers and whatnot. So based off of that, that's just her own personal conjecture that was probably something like six or nine years old when this transpired. And that's how they, because it's her own testimony. So that's how they go about in justifying that. But as you can already see, it's in clear contradiction with a very clear narration. And that's exactly why the majority of the scholars affirm the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha, that she was six at the time of the contract, nine at the time when she began to live in the home of the Prophet wasallam. And that is even till today, even after this other opinion has gained a little bit more um, traction, if you will, obviously because it helps to kind of answer some of the criticisms towards you know the the, the life of the prophet sallallahu even though this opinion is there the majority of classically and traditionally trained scholars are still of the opinion that is the narration of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that she was 6 at the time of the contract and 9 at the time when she began to live in the home of the prophet sallallahu and so that's basically the issue. And that was her age at this particular time. Now let's talk about what that brings about or what that brings to the table. What that basically puts on the table is now today based on our cultural context and our societal norms, we have this question that arises that how can you explain this? How can you justify this? How can you validate this? Marrying somebody that young, how is that even possible? So to understand this issue, I'm going to talk about a number of different items to kind of clear some, create some clarity in regards to the issue. First and foremost, let's talk about it from a purely like Islamic legal fiqh, and I would even say, you know, biological perspective. Because that's basically what the sharia looks at. The sharia takes basic biology into consideration when coming up with a ruling in this issue. And that is the issue that marriage is permissible, is legal, is allowed when somebody reaches or attains the age of adulthood. The age of adulthood. And that is not an arbitrary number, whereas today we have in some countries that would be 15. Some place it'd be 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, etc., etc. That is just an arbitrary number that is basically set up based off of their own experiences or their own cultural societal norms. But it's an arbitrary number. It has no real significance in terms of, you know, biology or any other type of, you know, human reality. It's just an arbitrary number. But if we take into consideration what is the universal what what is something that actually has some substance to it, and that is reaching the age of adulthood, puberty, and and maturity, 
And there's even, a, there's even an interesting, fascinating discussion about the fact that, classically speaking, majority of the very civilized uh, nations and peoples that came before us, the great civilizations that came before us, they basically had an understanding that there is childhood and then there is adulthood. You transition from childhood into adulthood. We don't have that. We have childhood, adolescence, and then adulthood. Adolescence, like the teenage years, and then you enter into adulthood. This is an idea that is a very, very modern phenomenon. And this idea was not classically, traditionally, historically held. And I'm not talking about Muslims, I'm talking about human civilization. You had childhood and you had adulthood. And so, and on top of that, even today this is the case, but basically, again, this is just basic biology and anthropology that at different places, at different times, in different, uh, amongst different ethnicities, different uh, weather, different atmosphere, different conditions, different circumstances, the onset of that adulthood or puberty, maturity, physical maturity, also differs from place to place, from people to people, from nation to nation. All right? And so nine or ten was very common and was the general norm in that particular society and in that particular culture. And there, there's tons of literature that documents this fact even from a non-Muslim perspective. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was into the age of what we would call maturity and adulthood at this particular time. So that's the first thing. So the first and foremost thing is to explain the marriage and that is that she was of that physical, physically mature age to be able to bear children, which was a basic marker of maturity and adulthood. Secondly speaking, is now let's talk about the cultural um, implications or the cultural understanding of marriage to someone at that particular age. We obviously understand that in our culture, globally even speaking, well we shouldn't, that's even part of the... Um, I guess you can say American, uh, well, what's it, what's it called? There's the, um, there's an interesting word. But uh, even, even that's part of the, like, the American entitlement or, you know, um, how we just project, you know, our culture onto other people. Even globally, it's not the case. In our culture and in many other parts of the world, there's this general understanding that marriage to somebody that young is considered extremely abnormal and even problematic. But what we have to basically do is we have to take a look through history to understand whether or not that was always the case. Right? Basic practices within anthropology talk about the fact that when you a analyze, when you understand, when you uh, inspect, when you look at another culture, another society, another civilization, an important part of the process, I was actually in Boston last month and I was talking to um, a sister over there who's doing her PhD in anthropology and she was explaining this, I asked her these questions, she was explaining this process to me and she was explaining that it's a very important part um, of the process that you be able to separate yourself from whatever cultural biases or prejudices that you may have that come from your own experience or your own culture and make sure that you not you do not impose them. You do not impose them upon the culture or the civilization or the society that you are looking at, that you are studying, that you are trying to understand because otherwise you're not understanding, you're judging. There's a big difference between the two. So when we take a very objective look, and we don't even have to look at Arabian society 1400 years ago, you can actually look at most civilizations up to probably about 100 years ago, and it was very commonplace. It was not seen as problematic. And that's just a fact of the matter. Right? When somebody says, yeah, but it's not right. Well, what you're saying, what you, what you have to understand is that that's not an academically viable statement. Right? You can say that in your culture, it's something that is not practiced, and that's completely fine. And every society and civilization has that right. To, so to the point, to the extent that if 50 years from now, or 100 years from now, in this very society, if it becomes completely abnormal for somebody to be married before the age of 40, they very well will look back at us getting married in our 20s, and say that they were animals. 
They were animals. They were barbarians. They were wild animals. They actually got married in their 20s. Can you believe that? And especially with the rate of maturity that we have in our society, that probably will end up being the case. All right? You got a 25-year-old who plays Call of Duty instead of going to work. That's a very, very, very plausible scenario. Right? And so that's, that's very likely the case. And if we were in that room and in that conversation 100, 200 years from now, where they consider getting married under the age of 40 is like barbarian and preposterous, barbaric and preposterous and ridiculous and backward and animalistic, how would we go about in defending ourselves in that conversation? We say, wait a second, wait a second, hold on. You can do what you like. But you can't pass that type of judgment on us. And so that is something that you have to embrace when engaging in this type of a conversation. And this is not from my perspective. Go talk to a professor of anthropology. If you think my sole agenda and motivation is to defend my religion, which it actually is, and I'm not going to shy away from that fact, right? But so be it. If you don't take my word for it, you don't trust me, you have every right to do that. It's a free country, brother. Right? So go talk to a professor of anthropology and ask him. Ask her about these types of... That's what I did. I sat down with a, prof, a PhD in anthropology and just objectively asked, how do you go about an understanding what seems to be a, to us, what seems to us to be uh, as an abnormal, as a very bizarre practice a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, 3,000 years ago, how do you go about an understanding that? And these are their usul. These are their principles by means of which that they understand this scenario. And that's why it's also very fascinating. So now let me, let me kind of establish this particular point. So because right now what I'm saying is that if this is something that was practiced, that was normal, then it can be objectionable today as a practice today. But you can't reach back 1400 years ago in history and say that is illegitimate because today we wouldn't do it. Right? 1500 years ago, there's a lot of things that they didn't do that we do today. That, that are even more animalistic and barbaric and bizarre to them. Right? If, if they, I mean, I'll use something very benign that is actually very, very thought-provoking if you think about it. They would never drink soda 1500 years ago. Like, they would, they would see that as like a death cocktail, right? That, that's like suicide. Like, somebody popping up, you on a suicide mission? Like, no, no, are you trying to kill yourself? No. If they saw like food sitting in a box inside of a home for a month, and then you pop it open and you eat it, they'd be like, oh no, you're, you're going to die, right? But that's a practice that we have. Just to use a very benign example, all right? And so, th- that's, that's something very important that has to be understood about this particular situation. So now let's take a look about how it was viewed and how it was understood historically. Khawla radiallahu ta'ala anha, a woman is the one who makes this proposal and suggestion and does not find it problematic. The nikah, Abu Bakr and Umm Ruman, the parents do not find it problematic. Okay, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it from the critic side. Somebody could say, well, these were all followers, these were all Muslims, they were all brainwashed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wal-ayyadhu billah, thumma al-ayyadhu billah. Right? Somebody could make that criticism or argument. Okay, but this nikah takes place in Mecca. Where the Muslims are an extremely small, oppressed minority. And understand that there are chock full of narrations. The history books are full. We've been talking about it. In this very dars, I go back and listen to the podcast. Right? All 75, 80 hours of it, listen to it. They criticized everything about the Prophet ﷺ. Everything and anything that they could find, because he was, he was challenging that society. He was challenging their beliefs, their 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 very way of life and living. He was challenging everything at that time. So they were on the offensive. They were not only on the defensive; they were on the offensive, and they criticized everything they possibly could about him. 
Everything, from the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he dressed, the way he conducted himself, every single word that, word that came out of his mouth was put under a microscope, and they explored, is this something we can scrutinize? Is this something we can exploit against him? This is what they lived for. This is what they lived for. Now, the Prophet wasallam has this contract, nikah, with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha at the age of six with the consent, adult consent of her parents. And then the, she moves into the home of the Prophet sallallahu at the age of nine. Now, if there was anything, like from, from a modern day perspective, there was anything you could take to discredit this man that you so categorically disagree with that you have spent the last 13, 15 years, 14 years fighting and opposing. If there was anything you could take to discredit him, you would figure from our perspective, this is it. We got him. We, 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 we cornered him now. We got him now. And there was zero criticism of this. Not within the Muslim community. Not even outside of the Muslim community. Okay, let's fast forward. Throughout the first 1200 years after the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Not even Muslim academics, let's look at non-Muslim academics. Who have talked about the life of the Prophet ﷺ, they have analyzed the life of the Prophet ﷺ, they have discussed the life of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ at length, as non-Muslims, as academics, they've gone through it. And there's not a single criticism you can find in any of the works that have been authored by non-Muslim scholars or academics. So much so, and this is really, for me personally, this is really um, something very fascinating. This criticism about the Prophet ﷺ's marriage to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and her age is not levied, this criticism is not brought forth by any academic even today. There's no academic criticism of this issue. It's basically from... It's, it's like an internet crack criticism. It's an internet issue. It's something you find in the cheap, you know, evangelical publications. It's something you find on blogs. It's something you find on YouTube, like YouTube, you know, vloggers. Those very interesting people that have their interesting videos. Right? This is, these are the criticisms that you find in these places. But where is there a reputable academic, a professor of history, sociology, anthropology, who is sitting down and making an academic argument in case about this particular issue. You won't find it. And you know what's very fascinating? The reason why you won't find it? Because they know based on their own education and their credentials and their qualifications and the science that they are an expert within, their usul, they understand that this is not a valid criticism. This is not a valid criticism. At all. And so that's a little, that's, that's basically a major, major issue that needs to be understood about this particular issue. Lastly and finally, and I don't like to get into this third one because that's more of like, you point the finger at me and I'll point the finger back at you. Because this is an intellectual argument. And intellectually, academically, there's really, it's not even a, a legitimate conversation. Because it just doesn't stand up to any type of academic or intellectual rigor or standard. It does not. But to just talk about it from a historical perspective, based off of a lot of research within certain academic institutions like Oxford and Cambridge and some of these other institutions, their historical narrative, and even some Jewish scholars are of this particular position, opinion as well, and even some Christian scholars classically have held this opinion, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was about 13 or 14 years old at the time she gave birth to Jesus. And the man that she was betrothed to Mary, Joseph the carpenter, that's their narrative, not ours, that's their narrative. The man that she was betrothed to marry, and that would basically be the kitab, the nikah, the contract, right? But it was not consummated, she did not begin to live with him. That 
again, the historical narrative is that he was over the age of 30. And so that's the nativity story. That's the biblical story. That's where the entire religion is what it's based upon. And again, you can just, you, you, I mean, the internet's there. Not only for bad things, but sometimes for good things as well. The internet's there as well. Go about and research it. The age of consent. Up to 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, in most of quote-unquote the western civilized world, was 12, 13, 14. That was the age of consent in most places. And it was very commonplace here, right here in the south, up to 50, 60, 70 years ago, there's short-term memory loss a lot of times. It was very commonplace within deeply religious communities, family-oriented communities, where it was very commonplace for, some, for a man at the age of 30 to be marrying someone at the age of 14. And that was commonplace. Now let's kind of fast forward to our cultural dynamic and norm and societal norms. And let's talk about it from this perspective. In our culture, in our society, it is not normal to marry somebody that young. And again, like I said, that is something that is completely legitimate. Every group of people, as long as, again, from an Islamic perspective, as long as it's not in contradiction with the laws that Allah has put in place, where it does not contradict the Qur'an or the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, every people have a complete license to practice whatever culture suits them. So if there are people in a place that decide that they marry after 40, then that's their culture. And they have every right to their culture. <clears throat> there might be criticisms about whether or not that's a productive practice. But my point is you cannot deem that illegitimate. Similarly, if the culture is shifted back to a place where people started marrying at the age of 12, 13, 14 at the onset of puberty, that would be a legitimate practice. And there'd be no criticism of that. Again, you can talk about the productivity of it, the efficiency of it, the, benef the benefit in it, but nevertheless, it'd be a legitimate practice. So in our culture, in our cultural norms, in our society, in our culture, it's not normal. And that's completely fine and okay as well. And therefore, just to kind of take away, I think this also takes the edge off of the paranoia and takes a little bit of the concern away to basically talk about this issue that it's not something that is a mandate of our religion. See, a lot of times when people say sunnah, and this is something I talk about with the students at the seminary, is terminology. The word sunnah has multiple meanings. Something that occurred in the life of the Prophet ﷺ is sunnah from a historical perspective. But there's a fiqh definition of the word sunnah, and that is a recommended practice. Not everything that occurred in the life of the Prophet ﷺ is a recommended practice. It's not to be implemented. So it occurred in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, but it's not something that we, are, we advocate or something that we try to implement. So if our cultural norms are that marriage comes in after the age of 20 or after the age of 18 or after the age of 25, then that is what it is. And in fact, because a lot of times a cultural practice or a societal norm is based off of a number of different things. It's based off of the physical, the psychological, the emotional, the even, uh, the, the, the emotional and even financial, economic circumstances of a people. So it actually would be very unhealthy and counterproductive for people to get married extremely young in our society. It could be very problematic. So it's not something that we have to try to implement and strive to revive. That's not our mandate. All right? We should maintain whatever is culturally, societally normal within our times and our place where we live. And that is marriage after the age of 18 or 20 or whatever, then that's fine. That should continue. And that will be even our Islamic recommendation. If somebody asks when you recommend to get married, I will give that answer based off of my society and my community. I know my people, I know what they are like, how developed they are emotionally and psychologically and financially and physically, and I will give a recommendation based off of that 18 or 24, or 22 or 21 or 19 or whatever arbitrary number they may be, but that will be based off of that. And that should continue. And that basically takes the edge off the paranoia. Yes, it's a historical precedent. And yes, it was valid at that particular time. 
But no, we are not, as Muslims, we are not on, out with some type of mission to revive that practice in our current times. That's not our mandate. It's not something we advocate. And it's not something that we're obligated to do. Lastly and finally, for, this, for the benefit of the Muslim brothers and sisters, all right, for the benefit of Muslims, to understand the wisdom of this. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I talked about it then, he basically said that three nights in a row he was shown a dream where Jibreel alayhi salam came and he had like this cloth, this silk cloth, and he opened it up and it was basically the image, like what we would call a picture of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he was told to marry her. فَإِذَا هِيَ anti. The Prophet ﷺ said that it was you in that picture. So this was something that was divinely arranged and divinely ordained. And now why? What is the reason? What is the hikmah behind this? And especially at a younger age, because most of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were at an, of an older age. Why her particularly? That should be no secret to any Muslim that has ever picked up a book of hadith or a book of seerah. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, if you count the number of unique narrations and traditions, she has narrated the most hadith on the Prophet ﷺ. On the list of narrators, she's third or fourth. But if you count unique narrations, no overlap, you omit the repetitions, then she, nobody has narrated more from her. Some of the scholars... Of the past, the great muhaddithun like Abdullah bin Mubarak, etc., rahimahumullah ta'ala, have commented saying that a third, we inherited a third of the religion from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was one of the hufad of the Qur'an, one of the memorizers of the Qur'an. She had written the entire Qur'an by her own hand, and she memorized thousands of incidents and sayings from the Prophet sallallahu Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, and when you study her life even outside of this, she was a very gifted poet. She had memorized all of the poetry, the pre-Islamic and post-Islamic poetry at that time. She had memorized all of it. And she was a poet herself. She used to write poetry. She was a nasaba. Her father, Abu Bakr, was a nasab. He was a genealogist. He knew everyone's lineage. And she inherited not only this gift, but this knowledge. Her father taught her to her. So she knew every single person and was able to any person that she came across, she could tell them eight generations back all their forefathers' names. And she knew everyone in the society. She knew that you and you are brothers and you and you are cousins and you are nephew and uncle and uh, grandfather and grandson. She knew everyone's connections. So when you piece all of this together, what you find is that she had photographic memory. She was supremely intelligent. Extremely intelligent. Right? And that's something that's well documented about her intellect and her rationale and her critical thinking. Where she even would engage the Prophet ﷺ in intellectual conversation and critical analytical thought. Where she would ask the Prophet ﷺ about issues and engage with him intellectually. And the Prophet ﷺ even would oftentimes remark and comment on how supremely intelligent she was. So we see the wisdom in it. And she basically was the teacher of, the, of not only that same generation of the Sahaba, but she was a teacher of the following generation. Some of the most knowledgeable people who led the following generation sat at the feet of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, learned and inherited the deen and the religion from her and carried it on forward. She was a very, very independent. And part of what shows her thought, her, how intelligent she was, she was extremely independent. Where she would oftentimes even question and even challenge the Prophet ﷺ in a respectful fashion, not to contradict the religion, but she would like engage with him intellectually. And later on, she would disagree with even, you know, some policies to where they would amend policies based off of the suggestion of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. It's very intelligent, very independent, photographic memory. And so when you piece all of that together, you see the profound wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in placing Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in the company, in close proximity, as close proximity as possible, by being the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and to be able to transfer and carry on the deen and the religion, 
after the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's a little bit of a discussion. And this basically took place in the Shawwal, according to Ibn Kathir, this took place in the Shawwal of that first year of the Prophet ﷺ's residence in the city of Medina, where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha moved in with the Prophet ﷺ. And then the last note I'll say is, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, her nikah was in the month of Shawwal. Her basically moving in with the Prophet ﷺ. Walima was in the month of Shawwal, and pre-Islamically they had superstitions about the month of Shawwal. They used to say a, a marriage in the month of Shawwal was cursed. It was cursed. And even in many Muslim societies, even after that, it's between the two Eids. So it's considered not a very good time to get married. But Aisha, and so there's a lot of superstition. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha destroyed that. And she used to brag about the fact that my marriage was in the month of Shawwal. My walima was in the month of Shawwal. Do you know anybody the Prophet ﷺ loved more than me? Is there any problems with my marriage? Nope. And in fact, that's why when young girls of the Ansar would be getting married, and their families and parents would be talking about when should we have the marriage, she used to say Shawwal. She used to insist on marriages being done in Shawwal. To, to break that pre-Islamic practice, and that goes back to showing you, very independent, very strong, very intelligent. All right, so that's a little bit of a discussion about the Prophet ﷺ's marriage to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Inshallah in the following weeks, we'll go back to talking about just the, the, the community of Medina and some of the political engagement that the Prophet ﷺ had with some of the neighboring tribes outside of Medina. And we'll basically go back to the, chronolo- uh, the chronology of the seerah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashhadu. لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك